Good afternoon, everyone. It is 2.30. Welcome to Cook County Health Department's weekly school health update. My name is Kelly Jones. I am a health educator senior with our community education and health education unit for Cook County Health Department. I'm your moderator and host for our, our meetings. I was about to say weekly meetings, but we have transitioned to biweekly. I want to change our format just a bit instead of our announcements. We are going to welcome Dr. Kieran Joshi, who is the co-lead of Cook County Health Department to present a CCDPH COVID-19 update. Welcome Dr. Joshi, thank you for taking the time to speak with us. Thank you so much, Kelly. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much for making time for this call. Uh, we really appreciate you all and are so thankful um, for all the work that you're doing. Um, I wanted to take some time today to review some of the recent COVID data that we're seeing. Um, and also, while you're not subject to um, our most recent mitigation order per se, uh, we did want you to have awareness of it as um, some of you may be getting questions. So that said, I'm gonna get right into it. Oh, there we go. Um, so um, I think all of you at this point are familiar with the Omicron variant of um, SARS-CoV-2, the, the virus that causes COVID-19. This is data from CDC that speaks to the proportion of cases that we believe are um, due to the uh, Omicron variant. And as you can see from the bar graph on the left side, on the left-hand side of the screen, uh, that proportion has increased very, very rapidly um, over the last few weeks. Latest estimates indicating uh, about 93% uh, of, what's, of what's being tested. All right, um, and this is reflected in some of our case data. You see on the left-hand side, a screen grab from our Shiny app. Um, the Shiny app, for those of you who may be unfamiliar with it, and I think judging from this audience, that's just a few of you, um, is the repository of all of our COVID data. It's available on our website. You can see the link there in the right-hand corner. Um, the uh, number I wanna point out here is the test positivity. Uh, which has increased from 7.8% back um, during Christmas week to 21% uh, just now. So that is a very significant jump in a very short amount of time. So um, you can see here uh, uh, sort of a, a line graph superimposed on a bar graph, um, which is the seven day uh, moving average of uh, cases as well as daily case counts over time. And uh, this is an epi, what we call an epi curve. It tells the story of an epidemic in some ways. It does have some limitations. Um, and you can see here um, in, on the right hand side of this graph um, that the case counts have increased really rapidly and indeed have surpassed any of our previous peaks. Now, some of you out there may say, well, you know, but it couldn't that be because we're just doing more testing? So is this increase in cases truly an increase in cases? Well, um, that's why we look at test positivity and uh, percent positivity. And so you can see that here again, uh, we've got a uh, moving average uh, in this uh, line graph of percent positivity. And you can see again that at this point we have surpassed, uh, and you can see that line uh, with the gray marker of 24% uh, percent on the right-hand side of the screen. We have clearly surpassed our winter surge from last year. So looking at this, you might say, Again, yeah, but you know, we've heard that Omicron is not so severe. So is it really important that we're seeing more cases and higher percent positivity? Um, for which I would point you to the next graph, which I think is central um, to our rationale for many of the public health measures that we're taking right now. So this is a graph now of inpatient hospital admissions for COVID-like illness. I wanna be clear on this data. We're pulling this out of hospital electronic health records. 
cut and those health records can be subject to errors. So I wanna, wanted to provide that disclaimer right off the bat. Uh, but at the same time, this is pretty good for making comparisons over time. And you can see pretty clearly here, um, again, that peak that you saw in uh, the previous graphs, although it's not as of high a magnitude, um, is again about to surpass the peak that we saw back in the winter. Um, so if you look down October 2020 to January 2021 is what I'm referring to as that last year's peak. Um, we do see ourselves really um, approaching and, you know, if you're to draw a line straight back here, likely surpassing what we saw um, in previous, uh, in the previous surge. So here again, I'm going to be the voice of uh, the skeptic and say, yeah, but, you know, we know from the experience in South Africa and potentially in Europe that Omicron tends to peak really quickly and it tends to recede really quickly as well. So while that is my fervent hope, um, I hope you understand that this next graph, um, so I'm having some trouble here navigating to the next graph. Kelly, maybe I'm gonna ask you to take control here because I'm having some challenges. Um, so while you're doing that, Kelly, so the next graph um, is essentially a graph of a model for um, the state of Illinois. This model is produced by um, the University of Washington's Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, a uh, well-known entity that um, has been producing uh, uh, various uh, estimates um, and mo specifically models for COVID-19 that are global and state by state. Um, their most recent model predicts that hospitalizations will um, peak in about a month or so. So I know that's probably not the news that many of you wanna hear on a Friday afternoon, um, but I, I, I feel like it's sort of part of my role uh, to be um, the bearer of bad tidings sometimes um, to the end that we understand why public health measures are being implemented and to the end that we all continue to follow those good public health measures uh, and of course support them. So as you can see um, from what I was, uh, as you can see um, on this graph, uh, February 8th is when we expect that peak to happen. Um, you can see if you sort of draw that line down from today, um, we're sort of at the halfway point to that peak. Now, again, this is a model. Um, all models are flawed. I hope it does not come to pass um, that we see the number of hospitalizations statewide that are projected here, um, but we certainly do need to be ready for that. Um, what I can say is in my conversations with colleagues um, who are at the front lines in hospitals in our jurisdiction, uh, there are some really serious and concerning conversations happening right now um, about the degree to which hospitals are being overwhelmed um, you know, conversations essentially saying, hey, we might not be able to go on bypass anymore because everyone is in just like a really bad situation. So um, next slide, please. Um, so uh, here I wanted to show you all um, some data that spoke to um, the idea of how protective uh, vaccines were um, in this day and age of the Omicron variant. Um, and I wanted to be able to show you all data that was um, local, hyperlocal, in fact. So this is data from our own health department that speaks to um, who is being hospitalized. And the different bars represent unvaccinated folks on the rightmost side um, in that uh, shade of salmon, shall we call it. Um, the uh, folks who have completed a vaccination series but have not been boosted in middle and teal, and the folks that have completed a vaccine uh, series with a booster um, on the left-hand side of the screen. And if you can barely see that bar for people who have a complete series with a booster, it's because the number of hospitalizations per 100,000 is so low for that group. Um, so if you compare that with the unvaccinated, you can see that the unvaccinated 
are many, 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 many more times likely to be hospitalized for COVID-19 as compared to their counterparts who are uh, vaccinated and boosted. Uh, we've shared this graph via our social and we can share this deck as well to this group. Um, I would encourage you to take a look at it and feel free to share it with whoever you think uh, might need convincing that vaccines um, are, have been and um, remain our mo one of our most effective uh, prevention measures for COVID-19. Next slide, please. So um, how are we doing with vaccinations for Ruben Cook County? Um, we stand at about 80% uh, of the population um, with uh, at least one dose, 60% um, who have completed a series. I believe when I last looked at the data, we were in or, in or around the 25 to 30% range for uh, vaccinated and boosted, although that um, that gray box is not here on this, on this uh, graphic. Next slide. Um, just in response to that question I saw, who, Who's, uh, who does this include? This is for that that uh, uh, graphic that I showed was for all suburban Cook County residents uh, that had been uh, vaccinated. Um, our denominator is um, the entire population of suburban Cook County. Uh, so no funny business there. We're not including people who are just eligible. This is the entire population. That is intentional. We wanna be very clear about um, how many people, what proportion of that, the population has been vaccinated and how much um, room we have, how much uh, work we have to do. Um, so what are we doing with respect to vaccination? You may have seen some of these slides before. I'm not gonna spend too much time on them. Um, I encourage you all to check out and um, share information about our uh, vaccine portal. It's vaccine.cookcountyil.gov. Um, people can find out where to be vaccinated um, they can find out where they can go for in-home vaccines, um, and they can go, um, if they have a community group that wants to sign up for vaccination, uh, click on that organization sign up button, again, in teal um, on the right-hand side of the screen there. Next slide. Um, we do offer uh, opportunity, we do, uh, we are aware of the barrier uh, that transportation can be a barrier for some folks and do offer rides to vaccination. Um, to access that, please call 833-308-1988. Uh, Next slide. Okay, um, so wanted to move really quickly here, uh, being aware of time um, and not wanting to uh, step on um, uh, the intrepid Ms. Lex, Ver Lex uh, Berta's toes, um, who I know has a lot to keep you informed about. Uh, the mitigation order that we recently issued um, that mitigation order reiterated the need for people in suburban Cook County to mask in all indoor public settings. That's regardless of vaccination status. We know that vaccination, as I mentioned earlier in that graph, is highly protective when it comes to uh, preventing severe illness and hospitalization, but you can still transmit COVID back and forth. So really important to continue masking. Next slide, please. Um, we are, we did also issue a second part to the order, which pertains to a requirement to show uh, proof of vaccination in indoor settings where either food and drink are served or on premises consumption. So a restaurant is an obvious example, a bar is maybe another, uh, somewhere that's sort of a grab and go, uh, not necessarily required. Um, and also health and fitness centers. The reason, the rationale behind both of those requirements is that, as I said earlier, vaccines highly effective in preventing severe illness. And while they're not as good at preventing transmission, they can still prevent transmission. They can still help. Uh, and of course, we know that in indoor settings, you have to um, take your mask off to eat, and when you take your mask off, you're more likely to transmit uh, and acquire COVID. With health and fitness centers, we know when you're exercising or exerting yourself, you breathe a lot more heavily, and the risk of acquiring and transmitting COVID goes up. Next slide. So um, some of the requirements uh, to be a little bit more specific is that anyone who's five years of age and up must show proof that they're fully vaccinated. 
uh, for now, the, for our purposes right now, fully vaccinated means two doses of an mRNA vaccine, Pfizer and Moderna, one dose of Johnson & Johnson. Why not boosted, you may ask? Um, and it's simply because we are waiting uh, for more and more people to be eligible for boosting and for CDC to potentially change their definition of what fully vaccinated means. That may be coming soon. More information to follow on that. Um, you also have to show um, identification that corresponds to that proof of vaccine. Um, this can be provided to an event planner, for example, if you're planning uh, something like a wedding. Next slide. Um, there is also a requirement, a, a requirement for employees. Employees, as opposed to patrons, um, can either be fully vaccinated or show proof of a weekly or negative test. Why are we making that distinction, you may ask? And the reason is that there is an OSHA uh, guideline that allows for that. We have to be in line with that OSHA guideline. Uh, employees are also unlikely to be removing their, ass, their masks um, as opposed to a patron at a restaurant who would be. Next slide. Um, so uh, there are also requirements for businesses to have signage and plans. Next slide. And I may speed through some of these. Uh, again, signage is available uh, for any businesses or establishments on our website. You see an example of a sign here. And I think I can probably buzz through the rest. Yeah, next slide. Next slide. Next slide. These are just examples of some templates that we've provided for businesses. This is all available on our website. Uh, next slide. Uh, we did establish some exemptions. Um, so anyone coming and going for less than 10 minutes for carry out, for example, or just to use a restroom uh, does not need to show proof of vaccination. Anybody who has a medical exemption, that's fine. Next slide. Some other very specific exemptions for a performing artist, an athlete who's visiting from out of the jurisdiction. Next slide. Um, Recent amendment um, with respect to uh, park districts specifically and other establishments that um, have uh, that support youth sports activities specifically, um, all of those are exempt. Next slide. Um, so, in terms of enforcement, um, I you know very readily confess this is a challenge given. The size of our jurisdiction and the limited staff resources that we have. That said, uh, we do take this very seriously. We do want to be responding to any complaints. All of those can be made on our website. Next slide. Thank you. Okay, uh, that's it for me. Thank you all uh, so much. Uh, really appreciate your time. Again, appreciate all the work that you're doing on the front lines to keep students safe and healthy. I say this as um, the Cook County Department of Public Health and in a personal capacity as a parent of two um, elementary school kids who um, I think I'm really appreciative of all the work that their, their schools are doing to keep them safe. So thank you so much. Happy to stay on for questions. Uh, turning it back over to you, Kelly. Um, I'm happy to stand again. I'll, I'll, I can answer questions in the chat. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Joshi. That was great information. I'm going to ask Lex if she can toss any questions to Dr. Joshi. I know she was manning the chat during the presentation. So if there's anything that pertains specifically to Dr. Joshi, I'm gonna ask Lex if she could read that, please. I can Thank do that. You. Yeah. yeah, I wrote down one question as being particularly relevant. Um, so the question is, are schools required to have attendees at school events show proof of vaccination, such as parents attending a sports game or a choir concert? No, we're really not getting into sort of um, providing that level of oversight to schools, as you know, all of the um, sort of guidance and regs that have come down have come down um, from IDPH and ISB. So I would continue to follow um, those guidelines and, and requirements. All right. Um, if anything else comes in for Dr. Joshi specifically, I will make sure uh, to send it your way. But otherwise, I think a lot of the questions are about the updated guidance that is forthcoming. We've got a lot to cover today, so I would advise you that if you need this stuff like today and you can't wait till Monday or this evening for stuff to be sent out, like have your screenshot key ready. 
So um, obviously we got housekeeping, some updated travel guidance. We're going to go in depth in the new isolation and quarantine guidance. We're going to talk about how lunch um, applies to that new guidance. We're going to talk about adaptive pauses because we've gotten a lot of questions about that this week, understandably. Uh, just a couple of vaccine updates um, and review um, what it takes to uh, think you have like an outbreak scenario in a classroom or just in your school in general, and then a couple of submitted questions. And then, of course, we'll go over the chat questions. I have been getting emails from some of you at 3 a.m., and I just want to say, please take care of yourselves. I know it feels like everything is on fire right now, um, but get your rest. <laughs> Um, hang in there, and I know it's crazy, um, but please do take care of yourselves. You deserve it. Okay, um, you guys know by now um, what our regular working hours are, that we're going to be prioritizing outbreaks um, in our responses. I just want to reiterate that um, be really specific when you're emailing us um, in your subject field have whether you're reporting cases in close contacts, whether you're, you've got a concern that you might have an outbreak situation, um, or whether it's a question about guidance that you have, just because um, there are a couple of us who handle the school email and we both hand, we all handle um, different aspects of it. So it makes it easier to know who to pass off those responses to. And then um, email is absolutely the best way to reach us. We are still, working on non-COVID things too. Um, and also, you know, we have regular meetings and everything like that. So the best way for us to get those notifications while we're working on other things or we're in a meeting is email. Um, phone calls should be reserved for outbreak emergencies or if your email never got a response after 48 hours. Um, I, some of us have been losing our voices just from answering so many phone calls. Um, so really, reserve that. We will try to get back to you via email as best we can, um, hopefully within 48 hours. I think we've had a pretty good turnaround time this week. Um, and then please don't give our individual emails and phone numbers to families. That's part of the reason we've been having issues with phone call this week, because we've just had a lot of concerned parents calling in. Um, so that's that about contacting us. And then um, as a disclaimer for what you're going to see, um, IDPH is still working on updating their documents for the new quarantine and isolation stuff from the CDC. All the CDC stuff will be adopted. The only thing um, that might be different is there might be like more details specific to what we do as a state. So right now, because I don't have those details, just know that this is a very generalized view of it and we'll add any details that come out in our next webinar. Um, and then also, um, this will answer a couple of questions in the chat. Once IDPH updates their documents and we have things we can actually send to you guys, um, that's when we will be implementing the new shortened isolation and quarantine. You do not need to go back and retroactively change any release dates. Do not create that work for yourselves. It will be a nightmare. So you do not need to do that. Once things go into effect, future cases in close contacts will be impacted, but not past ones. So don't worry about doing that. All right. Travel guidance. <laughs> Nowhere is good to travel if you're unvaccinated. Uh, it's, we're kind of past that stage with winter break being over. Um, but this is what everything looks like. It's not great. We would maybe be considered red even. Um, as you saw Dr. Josie's metrics, we're not in a great place. Um, so just to, since we've had so many questions about travel guidance, I do want to actually go through this table. Um, so vaccinated individuals will have a fairly safe and easy time traveling, especially if they're boosted. I, if you are an adult who's eligible to be boosted and isn't, I would also say it's not a good idea for you to travel right now. But for vaccinated individuals, um, you don't need to uh, do a travel quarantine when you come back. Um, just monitor your symptoms for 14 days and get tested if you start to feel ill in any way. I don't know if you guys can tell, I've got a bit of a runny nose, so that would send me to get tested if I had traveled anywhere, but I've barely made it past my block this week. So um, for unvaccinated individuals, um, they should be tested three to five days and they should stay home for those five days. Um, and so that's more about your staff 
for students, we don't want to keep kids out of school for uh, too long, so they can return to school immediately, but they need to get tested um, a few days after they return, and as always, monitor symptoms for a full 14 days. For international travel, um, for flights, they kind of have that procedure down. You've got to have a negative test result before you get to the U.S. Um, or documentation of a recent recovery. Um, we've had some questions about families who like went and drove up to Canada or down to Mexico. Um, if you're a U.S. citizen or permanent resident, you don't have to provide proof of vaccination for a land entry. Um, so there's that, but you should, for your schools, um, you know, they should still get tested when they return. Um, again, for international travel, students may return, um, but they do need to get tested. And then for cruises, um, avoid them completely, <laughs> regardless of your vaccination status. But if someone does go on a cruise, um, they should get tested before their trip, and then they need to get tested after their trip regardless of vaccination status or whether they have symptoms or not. So that is the big table of travel. Hopefully there's not a whole lot of that going on between now and I guess MLK Day if people travel for that. Um, all right, so let's get into the new isolation guidelines. So this is when someone is positive or when someone who has had documented close contact with a case uh, starts to develop symptoms, and this is regardless of vaccination status or age if they are developing symptoms or testing positive. So, um, student and staff cases will have to isolate for a minimum of five full days. That is the, if you take away anything from this, it's five days is the big number now. Day zero is the day that symptoms began, or if they didn't have symptoms, the date of the positive test, and day one is the first full day of that isolation. And I have an example because we've had a lot of questions about how to count it out. So I have an example at the bottom for isolation and I have an example for quarantine when we go through that. So you do have dates you can check there. Um, on day five, which would be the fifth full day of isolation, the day before they would come back, uh, you should have them evaluate for new or worsening symptoms. If they have no symptoms or they're you know, on the mend, feeling good, they can return the next day. And then for the next five days after they return, um, which would be completing what used to be that 10 day isolation period, they need to wear a mask um, around, this right? okay, yes, I, I typed something incorrectly. They must wear a mask around others when they're indoors at all times. Um, they have to avoid people who are immunocompromised or at high risk for severe disease. So this would include elderly relatives, pregnant teachers, staff undergoing chemo, you know, things like that. Um, and if this masking requirement isn't achievable in the school setting or for this student in particular, um, they have to be excluded for the full 10 day isolation period. And I'll talk about how to address lunch in a couple of slides. Um, if they do end up developing new or worsening symptoms after they return, they have to go back to isolation immediately, and that five-day process starts over again. Um, and as you guys know, you've got to be fever-free without the aid of medication for at least 24 hours before returning. If um, during those initial five days after they test positive, um, if they have new or worsening symptoms, they'll just continue to isolate up to that standard 10-day period. After 10 days, they can return if they're fever-free and feeling up to returning. Um, so I've got an example for you guys at the bottom. So this example is someone who is asymptomatic. If they tested positive today, like through SHIELD screening, today would be day zero, the seventh is day zero. Then on day five, which is the 12th, um, five days after day zero, they should evaluate their symptoms, see how they're feeling. If they're still feeling okay, um, then they can return on day six, which would be the 13th. So when you're going through and calculating return dates, um, the trick here is assuming everything goes well, they're feeling better or they never had symptoms, um, and you're in a situation where you know the students are going to be masking pretty well, then just add six days to the initial date of the test or um, when their symptoms started. Just add six and you're good to go. That's the new trick. 
Um, so that is for isolation. We don't have our own flow chart for this, um, but I did see on the main CDC's Twitter <laughs> this really nice flow chart. So if uh, IDPH developed ones, I will share this, um, but this is a pretty good one that is from Maine um, that just goes over the CDC guidance. Um, it's pretty easy to follow. I think that isolation is a little bit easier um, to handle than quarantine, the new quarantine guidelines. So there's this flow chart, screenshot it if you want. These slides will be distributed. I know it's kind of confusing, but I think part of the point of these new guidelines is that the big number is five for everything now. So hopefully that's at least easier to remember. Um, and that's because most people who go on to develop uh, symptoms or actually are very infectious, that happens within five days of exposure. Um, all right, so new quarantine guidelines. So this is for the close contacts. First, who does not need to quarantine? People who are 18 and up who are boosted, or if they're not, if they're 18 and up and aren't eligible for a booster yet. So this is more about like where kind of like seniors would fall or very young teachers, I guess. Um, so within five months of the second Pfizer dose, six months of the second Moderna dose or two months of J and J. Basically what this is saying is if you're not eligible to be boosted yet, but you've gotten your full series without the booster and you, you know, you can't get your booster yet, then you don't have to quarantine. You're considered fully vaccinated. If you are eligible to be boosted and you haven't been, then you are not considered fully vaccinated in a quarantine context. I know that's confusing and I'm sorry, um, but that's how it works with the boosters. For people ages five to 17, um, they're considered fully vaccinated if they've gotten their two Pfizer doses. Um, because they are aren't they aren't eligible for a booster yet. So if they've got their two doses um, and they're two weeks out after that second dose, then they're good to go. They're fully vaccinated. Don't have to quarantine. Um, and then, as always, those who have tested positive in the last ninety days um, do not have to quarantine. Um, science their studies have shown that uh, you've got pretty good immunity for about three months at least um, after an infection. Um, Omicron is a little scary in there, but three months is still a pretty good measure for that. Um, however, even if you don't have to quarantine, you still have to wear a mask if you're a close contact. When you're indoors, you need to stay socially distanced, um, and it's still recommended to get a test, but it's not required. So who does need to quarantine then? Everybody else. Uh, <laughs> So anybody who's eligible for a booster but is not boosted needs to quarantine. And then anybody who is unvaccinated or who isn't fully vaccinated yet. It might just be easier to think about whether someone falls into these two categories when you're thinking about whether they need to quarantine instead of if they are in these categories for not needing to quarantine. Um, so quarantine length, just like isolation, is now five as a standard um, and can be five to ten days um, with day zero being the date of their last close contact with the case uh, to whom they were exposed. So again the big takeaway standard length is five days for those who uh, don't have any symptoms after exposure by day five um, and as long as they can be consistently and correctly masked indoors they can return on day six. If they aren't sure if they're developing symptoms or it's not possible to stay consistently and correctly masked and spaced in the school setting. Like, you know, if you've got like a four year old who doesn't quite have masking down yet or things like that, um, or it's someone who's mask exempt, then their quarantine length is going to be 10 days. So hopefully that answers some of the questions in the chat about this too. If they're unable to wear a mask, their quarantine length is 10 days standard. Um, test to stay will still be available. I'm guessing that um, they will cut it off after day five, um, but we don't have that documentation yet, so I can't totally say for sure, but test to stay is still an option for people. Um, so then on day five, the day prior to return, 
that close contact should be evaluating their symptoms and they should get tested. Um, this is not a requirement, but CCDPH will support a school that says there is a testing component to this. Um, it's strongly recommended. Upon return, they need to be masked and distanced properly when indoors, as I said. If any symptoms develop after they return, they need to go isolate immediately and they should get retested to see if they've converted to a case. Um, so for my standard example, it's almost identical to the one for isolation. So let's say someone was exposed today at school on the 7th. Um, if they don't end up developing symptoms and can remain masked and distanced at school, they can return on the 13th, no problem. Just add six days to that initial date. So that's how the calculations would go. Maybe that will, you know, if you're in Excel ways, you can just add plus six to your return dates uh, as a column and be done with it for the day. That would be nice. Um, okay, and then if you're looking for all of this in writing, this is in the CDC guidance, um, like if you're worried about how the boosters apply and things like that, it's in the guidance, the written guidance, and I can put links in the chat um, if you haven't been able to read the CDC guidance that came out. Um, I read it a bunch of times this morning, so I would understand if you haven't had time to look at it yet. And this is, again, from Maine CDC. Um, they've created a really nice flowchart for quarantine. Um, I know the previous slides are worry, so it might just be easier to look at flowcharts when you're going through these. Okay, how do we deal with lunch? So, during times at school when masks are typically removed, whether that's lunch or snack time if you've got younger kids, things like that, um, someone who's able to return uh, but is still within their 10 days after they've been exposed and are a close contact after they've tested positive or um, they were a uh, person who developed symptoms, um, they need to be six feet away from others if they have a mask off. That is non-negotiable. Um, if the lunchroom isn't set up to have students six feet apart as the default, they can't eat in the lunchroom. Or you could set up a specially spaced section of the lunchroom where everybody is six feet apart, or they can eat supervised in a separate room um, if you need to accommodate them. If these accommodations can't be made in the school setting, and I understand that spacing is an issue, um, then just isolation and quarantine will be the standard 10 days at that school, and there's absolutely no problem with that. We will support you if um, accommodating people who can't wear masks is going to be um, a bit of a challenge with the spacing and uh, the population of your school. So lunch is a biggie. Let's talk adaptive pauses and remote learning. There are no definitive thresholds at this point in time, um, but the CDC does have a uh, page you can go to that offers some suggestions. You saw what our metrics looked like when Dr. Joshi presented. Our local transmission levels are um, over a thousand <laughs> cases higher than when we last had a webinar. We are not in a great spot. So there's that with the local transmission levels. But other things that I'm sure you guys want to consider is logistical challenges caused by lack of staff and teachers because they're isolating and quarantining or you feel like you can't get a handle on an outbreak situation just because there's so much going on with it, or um, you don't have the ability to implement prevention measures that you should be, like you can't keep up with contact tracing in the school, there's just not enough staff to handle that, or you don't have enough staff to supervise lunch and to keep track of who actually has close contact with each other at recess and indoor recess, I guess, and things like that. Um, so those are some very good things to consider um, and know that we will always support you in this decision to take an adaptive pause and we will help you regroup um, if you need that assistance. Um, so, you know, right now things are a little bit crazy and um, if you as uh, health staff are like, I can't keep up with this reporting, 
please communicate that to your schools. That is a huge consideration for adaptive pause, and we will support you in that because you still need to be reporting all these cases and contact tracing. And that's a huge ask of you guys. I do, I do know that. It's a huge ask. So um, that is definitely something to consider with adaptive pause. The last thing I want to talk about with adaptive pauses is to not use testing positivity rates as part of your considerations because um, the positivity rates were artificially inflated when schools stopped screening tests over winter break because that number wasn't padded by the number of negative tests we were getting out of school. So basically what I'm saying is that number isn't really meaningful in your consideration to take an adaptive pause. You can use our other metrics. Those are not artificially uh, padded or anything like that, but the test positivity is just because of how many of you have been uh, doing such a great job with screening programs. Okay, let me check the time. Okay. And then only a couple more things to talk about. Vaccine updates. Um, you guys probably know all these right now, but those ages 12 to 15 should get a booster dose um, five months after receiving uh, their second Pfizer dose. That's been adopted by IDPH. Um, those 16 and up should get a booster five months after receiving their second dose of Pfizer, also approved by IDPH. And then if you've got five to 11 year olds who are immunocompromised, they can receive their third dose 28 days after their second dose. Um, I think these are generally more personal things for families to talk about with their physicians, but um, just in case you guys need that information, here it is. Okay, testing resources. Um, for private schools specifically, since public schools are already eligible for um, SHIELD, um, if you're a private school that wants free RT-PCR testing in the Midwest, um, HHS has funded um, a company called, I think it's pronounced Battelle, um, to administer these tests to private schools. It will be uh, free for private schools. Um, if you are paying for SHIELD or third party stuff, it's an alternative. It is FDA authorized um, and there's a link to register here. Um, so if um, you are struggling to come up with the funds for SHIELD because you're a private school, um, there is an alternative resource for you. All right, last thing before we do questions, um, some things to think about with regards to outbreaks. Um, you should have three or more cases. Um, and when we talk about 10% of a core group, we're really referring to like a team or a club, not necessarily a small classroom unless that is a classroom that has a huge chunk of people who can't mask, then we need to know about it. But um, just if it's a classroom of 20 and you've got two cases, we're not gonna be considering that an outbreak. But if you've got three or more cases in a classroom, um, you need to be asking them and yourself, is there a potential link between these cases? Um, were they close contacts to each other in the school setting? Um, think about how they could have been exposed gather information, um, and then we do have the outbreak worksheet that will take you through these considerations and what information to gather if you're worried that you have an outbreak on your hands. And remember, you can close a classroom if you feel like you don't have a handle on an outbreak situation yet, and we can help you work through that and um, help those kids who weren't impacted by the outbreak come back while we isolate and quarantine anybody who was. So that is an option that's available to you. All right, submitted questions. Given the high level of community transmission, how should we respond when the classroom has multiple cases? Just like I said with the outbreaks, first determine if the cases are connected. Right now, what we're seeing in the community with this high level of transmission is also reflected in schools. Um, so it's possible that you just have a lot of unconnected cases in a classroom. That is actually quite likely and we've been seeing that very often. Um, even if it's determined that there's not an outbreak, if a significant portion of the class is out due to isolation and quarantine, you, may, you might want to shift to remote learning or distribute those students to different classes um, if you've got like a third of the class out or something. I remember um, 
that would happen with chicken pox when I was in elementary school a long time ago. Um, they would have to shift when a huge part of the class was out. Um, so that are those are some things to consider with just a lot of classroom cases. And then had a question, and it's a good question. What is the rationale for keeping schools open during the current spike? First, as you guys know, the benefits of in-person learning versus remote learning. We've seen so many studies come out in the last couple of months about how mental health has suffered during remote learning or uh, families don't have access to resources that they would normally have. And just the general learning process for most people is better when it's in person. So that's a big one. The second thing is that schools are generally safer compared to the general public because they're a place where you can enforce mitigation measures more easily. I know it's not easy, but more easily than you could at like a gym or something. So you guys have testing in place. You can set up a classroom to be distanced. Um, you've got cleaning staff. You can um, enforce masks. Uh, ask anybody to wear a mask if they aren't exempt, things like that. The school setting is not less safe than just having kids in the general public. It is, studies have shown time and time again that the school is actually a protective factor when transmission is high. Um, and then also, of course, and I know there are vaccine hesitant families, but the availability of vaccine for those five and up make the potential for schools to be a very safe environment. Um, is there any possibility that we will have another lockdown? It is incredibly unlikely. I can't say impossible, um, but it's very, very unlikely. Um, I think the only situation where that would happen is if we are back to the way we were in early 2020, where we didn't have like enough ventilators and people were dying because we couldn't provide them with care that they would get if hospitals weren't totally crowded. Um, we're not in that place. There's, I mean, I'm not going to say that there's not a ton of hospitalizations and ICU admissions, but we're not in a place where we are worried that people are going to be dying just because they didn't have access to certain technologies. Um, so it's very unlikely there will be another lockdown. Um, but if you're, if you were hoping for a lockdown or something so that you can go into an adaptive pause, Give us some good reasons and we will totally support you in an adaptive pause. And then finally, for students who do not mask well or consistently, especially um, if you're, you've got a student who's in special ed with a mask exemption, do I understand correctly that they should continue with the 10 day quarantine slash isolation um, if they're positive or close contact? And that is exactly correct. You have correctly interpreted that. Um, if you can't mask, it's 10 days automatically. New guidance released today by IDPH indicates that fully vaccinated individuals who are 18 and up and identified as close contacts now must quarantine for five days regardless of symptoms unless they are fully boosted. This is correct um, given that they are eligible for a booster. If they are not five to six months out of their first round of being fully vaccinated, um, then they're still considered fully vaccinated. So instead of thinking about it as a booster, just think about whether they're fully vaccinated. Um, so that's correct. For that question, I do want to add that CDC is asking us not to use the word boosted and fully vaccinated and use the term up to date with their vaccination to be more, I guess, in tone with the other vaccines that, we're, that we do. Um, all right, next question. If someone tests positive and then develops symptoms the next day, do you start counting from symptom onset for isolation time? And that uh, you would start counting from the positive test. It's whether symptoms develop first or the test happens first, whichever happened first, um, that's where you start counting from. Uh, let's see. Oh, I just lost where I was. Bear with me, everybody. Um. The amount of time spent entering data for vaccinated close contacts who are not required to quarantine is time consuming. Is there any consideration of removing this requirement? Um, no, because as I mentioned, vaccinated um, people who are up to date on their vaccinations or not up to date, um, that's a consideration with isolation and quarantine. So that's still going to be something we need to see. 
Um, and again, this happens rarely, but it does happen. We have also gotten fake vaccination records. So um, it is important for us and our tracers to be able to go into our system and check that someone was vaccinated. All right, um, let's see. Are at-home tests the same as rapid PCR testing? No, at-home tests are different and at-home tests are antigen tests. So, um, and I, I have gotten a couple emails about this this week too. The BIAPS tests that get distributed to schools from IDPH and from CCDPH, those aren't meant to be home antigen tests. Binax does have a home antigen test, but the instructions and are a little bit different. And, um, you know, you guys are informed professionals who will know how to give a Binax test. A lot of people who are taking home tests have never <laughs> stuck a huge Q-tip up their nose and figured out how to do it. So it, it is different. Um, so you shouldn't be giving those Binax tests you get um, to be used as home tests unless they are designated as home tests. And those, again, are antigen tests. Um, this may eventually be addressed, but this is a little, uh, I do, I understand that this is so much work for you guys. Um, I really do. And if it's getting to a point where it's too overwhelming, think about taking an adaptive pause. Um, just to give you an update on when we think we're going to peak, um, we, we might peak later, but uh, a lot of predictions from modeling companies and CDC are saying we'll peak around the end of January. So hopefully later in the winter, it gets a lot more manageable. Um, as Dr. Joshi said, Omicron can burn itself out pretty quickly. So knock on wood that it does burn itself out pretty quickly and it gets more sustainable. Um, let's see. I know I answered that one. Um, answer that one. Oh, a couple questions about the reliability of testing with Omicron. Over the last week, I've seen uh, several cases of a symptomatic person who had a negative PCR, but a positive antigen, um, and kind of those situations. There's still good reliability with testing with Omicron. The reason you're seeing so many of these is what we call in statistics the law of large numbers. So because we're seeing so many more cases, those things that are rare, like a symptomatic person testing negative on PCR but positive with antigen, happens more frequently just because there's literally more people <laughs> um, who are cases. So that's probably why you're seeing a lot more of it is just because there's more of everything. So then the frequency of what used to be really rare has gotten more common just because there's so many more cases. Um, there's still very reliable tests and um, we don't have uh, any indication from like looking at the genetic sequence of Omicron that the tests wouldn't pick up what they normally pick up. Um, okay. Let's see. Can we use BIACS now in the school setting to return symptomatic students or staff back to the classroom? Um, right now in our insanely high transmission levels, we're only accepting PCR. That could be rapid or lab-based. Um, I, I know that it seems like PCR is hard to come by right now. Um, so we are discussing about what to do about antigen tests and returning but until we have definitive answers from IDPH about that, please only accept PCR. Um, let's see. We've gotten a lot of questions about the 90 day period after an infection and whether or not we should be testing that person. Um, and if they chose to get tested, do we ignore the results? The only time you should get tested if you're within that 90 day window is if symptoms develop new, like you felt better and now all of a sudden you have symptoms again, or um, you know, you've kind of had a ruddy nose, but all of a sudden your symptoms have gotten worse. Um, those are the only times when there's new or worsening symptoms where you wouldn't disregard the results uh, 
in that 90 day window. Um, I'll work on trying to find a resource where that is generally stated. I feel like it might be in the decision tree, but also when I opened the link to the decision tree, it was being updated. So I don't know if that's readily available. Um, and then um, if within the 90 days that someone has had Delta, is it possible for them to contract Omicron? It is technically possible, but would be very rare and nearly impossible for someone with a healthy immune system. If it's someone who's immunocompromised or old or taking some kind of medication or steroid or something, um, it puts them a little, little bit higher risk of being reinfected, but the chance of being reinfected within those 90 days are very low. All right, we are almost halfway done with the questions. Hang in there, everybody. If parents get a negative PCR from their child's PCR, Oh, okay. If parents get a negative PCR after their child has been positive, does the first test result stand? Yeah, if you're talking PCRs, unless a lab contacts you to say that this result wasn't valid because we swabbed incorrectly or because there was an error in the lab setting, that positive PCR result stands. Um, so hopefully that answers that question. Um, let's see, go back. If household members can't isolate or quarantine, does that mean kids have to do 15 days or can they start on day six of positive? Okay, so, um, yes. With the adoption of the new five day rules, um, that does mean they can come back sooner, but until that goes into effect by IDPH, continue to count the way you have been counting. Um, I Several of you have emailed this week and we've been like, because kids aren't members of the general population and they are going to be entering congregate settings in schools, um, it doesn't count for now. That stands until IDPH comes out with that documentation and more specific guidance about these scenarios. Um, I heard that schools could stop contact tracing soon. Is this correct? Um, some of you may have heard that IDPH, well, the state of Illinois is hoping to um, centralize contact tracing, meaning that people at the state will handle it instead of us as your local health department handling it. Whether that gets adopted or not, you will still have to be contact tracing in the school setting. Um, you don't have to do any contact tracing in the home setting or for travel sports or a youth group or anything like that, but we don't know what goes on in your school. The state doesn't know what goes on in your school and who's sitting where. Um, so you still will need to be collecting like seating charts and things like that. So that's not gonna stop whether it's still us handling schools or it's the state handling schools. Uh, case question. A student had symptoms at the start of break. No testing was done. Mom tested positive on the 28th. Should this student be considered a close contact or should the student get an antibody test? Um, unless this student who had symptoms was a known close contact before they started symptoms, um, they're not eligible to get an antibody test. Um, so going forward from just the information that's in this chat question, um, they should be considered a close contact. Um, can we release teachers if that would keep us open? I'm sorry, no. Um, schools are situations where you've got lots of different vulnerable populations. You have children, you have older people, you've got pregnant people. Um, it's not gonna be safe to release them before that five days. If you're in a situation with staffing like that, you don't have to take a long adaptive pause, but you could go remote for a day or two and give out worksheets, things like that. Um, we don't have to apply new shortened quarantine and isolation guidelines to prior cases, but can we? I guess if you wanna take on that work, 
go for it um but obviously only for people who are still like in their isolation and quarantine periods not like going back for people who it doesn't apply to anymore with the new guidance it states that the last five days the positive cases have to strictly mask can they not eat lunch then at school they can eat lunch in school they just have to be six feet away from anybody else um that doesn't mean they can't eat in the lunchroom it just means they need to be six feet away and you can accommodate that however you would like um you know without like having a weird covid only space that kind of shames those kids obviously don't do that um but you can accommodate them in different ways um if they have their masks down at any point, do we need to send them home to finish the remainder of their isolation? If this is a kid who you know is not going to be wearing their mask consistently, and I know there are kids at any age group who are like that, my partner is a teacher, I do know, then they should be taking the 10-day isolation or quarantine. That's unsafe for anybody else who's around them then, otherwise. Um... Just the clarification question. So day zero, then five days of five full days of isolation, then return on day six. That is absolutely correct. That's what you have to remember for isolation and quarantine. Um, how is adopting these new guidelines safe if our numbers are the highest they have ever been? Um, there are a couple components of this, and I'm not going to say some of them aren't political, um, but science you know studies have shown that the crucial number of days is those first five to seven days um most people are not going to develop symptoms um after those five to seven days if they're going to be infected at all and then we do know one of the reasons that makes covid such a good uh pandemic virus is that you're most infectious before you're symptomatic, before you even know you're sick. So it's so easy to spread because you have, you're giving off more virus when you're initially sick and even before that. You are giving off much less virus five days and after um, for the vast majority of people. Unless you are like intubated in the hospital, you are not giving off um things that can infect others after that initial period for the most part um so it is it is a risk management game i'm not going to lie and say things are impossible after five days but um basically it's risk management so if a teacher is pregnant can the positive student return in five days or ten um they can return in five days but i would talk to that pregnant teacher um just to double check that it's okay with them because a pregnant person is going to be slightly immunocompromised and getting a COVID infection can impact them and their risk of miscarriage. Um, so it is important in those situations to take that into consideration. Um, so students with medical mask exemptions are still 10 to 14 days quarantine isolation. Uh, 10 days blanket sweep for both quarantine and isolation just 10 days um how should we get a student who's returning to school after five days isolation to avoid their teacher who happens to be pregnant do we need to continue to exclude that student because of the teacher's pregnancy status um you again this this is more of an individual choice it is not a requirement but someone who is potentially infectious should be avoiding immunocompromised people it might mean shifting them to a different class or again talking to that teacher um things like that uh, uh how can we manage this we have hundreds of covid cases and we cannot check in with everyone at day five it's not your responsibility to check in with everyone at day five give them the release dates like you normally do and have them you know sign a statement saying like I don't have symptoms or my symptoms are resolving then you've got that in writing from them and you didn't need to phone in a check you know things like that um individuals who are 18 and up and identified as close contacts now must quarantine for five days regardless of symptoms unless they are boosted 
to. Yeah, that is correct. Unless they're, if they're up to date, they do not need to quarantine. If they're not up to date because they're eligible to be boosted and, and aren't, then they do have to quarantine. Um, please, oh, this is a good question. Please clarify for the preschool population, census population do not wear their masks appropriately. I definitely know that. I've got kids I know who will just put their mask in their mouth. Um, and we have many mask exempt students. Can I assume we continue to have them quarantined for 10 days? That's correct. When you've got situations like that, you've got preschools, you've got pre-K, you've got before and after school care where you can't guarantee masking is going to go well, 10 days, not a question. 10 days, that's how it is. Um, do the same quarantine requirements apply to the general public? Uh, yes. Um, they will have the same requirements in like their workplaces. This is the guidance the CDC wrote for the general public was basically copied and pasted for schools with more details for the school setting. So it's basically the same. Can a student who was just tested positive and had two Pfizer shots still get the booster if the student is 15? Um, you can still get your booster when you become eligible as long as you're not feeling ill. Um, so yes, that that is, if they've just tested positive um, and are feeling ill, they should not. But after they start to feel better, there's no reason why they can't, they need to just tell um, their physician um, that they are COVID positive if they go and get it during their isolation period. Um, blah, blah, blah. Is test to stay an option for someone who's not yet fully boosted to avoid quarantine? Yep, test to stay is still an option. Um, for unvaxxed kids who opted out of test to stay, do they quarantine for 10 or 14 days? Uh, they should quarantine for 10. 10 is kind of the cap um, at this point. Um, so just just think your numbers you have to remember are 5 and 10. That's that's it for everything. Um, if they are unable to quarantine from the positive individual and they continuously are exposed, are they required to quarantine? Um, so if you're talking um, continuous exposure because you live with a case, they begin their quarantine from the last time they could have been exposed to the infectious individual. So yes, they do still have to quarantine. Um, Does CCDPH or IDPH have a timeline as to how long all of these mitigation efforts will exist, i.e. contact tracing, isolation of cases, quarantine, close contacts, hitting the line list? I wish I did have a timeline for you. <laughs> I would love one myself, um, but we don't have a timeline. I'm sorry. Whoever takes over contact tracing, whether it's still going to be us or the state, you'll still have a role in that. You will still have responsibilities there. Um, and I can't say for sure, but there is a likelihood that even after things calm down a little bit in the general population, schools will still have more responsibility in taking mitigation measures just because um, there's the school population in within the school population. Some people aren't eligible to be vaccinated yet. And um, a lot of people, a lot of children are not yet vaccinated. So schools will probably still have it a little bit longer than the general population. With new guidelines. I'm sorry, I just wanted to cut in. We are way over time and I, I figured we would, so I'd let it go on a little bit longer, but if we could like maybe ask maybe one or two more questions and then we'll do the announcements real quick and we'll have to pick it up next time. Sorry about that. No, Thank that's fine. I will. Um... Actually, Lex, um, I want to clarify one of the questions mm -hmm. for, for the five day isolation for people that tested positive. It is five day for, from the test only if they're asymptomatic. If they are symptomatic, we will always go with symptom onset because when someone takes the test, does not change the disease process. People are most infectious two days before the onset of symptom and about, and a few days after. There is kind of a little bit of a tail and it's different depending on the person. That five day, and this is especially we, important if we go do a five day isolation because the shield will pick up test results before onset. So in that case, their isolation will be five days from the, on, from the onset of symptoms. So I just wanna be real clear on that because we are using the five days and not the 10 that give us a little bit of a leeway. 
real quick before we go back to you, Kelly, um, I will do my best. I just copied and pasted the chat in my notes. I will do my best to add those to submitted questions to get this out to you guys, just so we get some of these answered. If we don't, please email us later today or on Monday, and we will try to get your question answered uh, as quickly as possible. Thank you guys so much, and try to take some time for yourself this weekend. Please don't email us at 3 a.m. Get some sleep. Thanks, Lex. I will, um, when Lex is able to put together those submitted questions, I will send that out to the group in case your question was not answered. I realize that there are a lot of questions and a lot of confusion and a lot has happened in the last couple weeks. So we're trying to answer these questions as best we can. I just wanted to give a quick couple updates before we let you all go. I'm going to share my screen really, really quickly. And just to reiterate that since January 1st, we have gone to a bi-weekly schedule for our webinars. So the webinar, next webinar is January 21st. You'll see all that reflected in Eventbrite if you try to go in to register. So just as a reminder, there is no webinar next week. We have gone to a bi-weekly format and we are recorded. I know this is a lot of information. It will be uploaded to our YouTube page as well as our website. When our communications team is able to upload that, they're pretty quick. So you can go back and reference and use it for uh, PD if you need to or anything like that. And we'll bypass all of this. And here is our contact information. If anyone does not have that, it'll be on the slides that you will get. Anyone who is interested in getting EpiPens for their schools, they can send that information to me, kjones1, at cookcountyhhs.org. And just some information on updated uh, vaccination events that we have going on right now at Leakin Sons in Country Club Hills. It started on Thursday. We'll be there again tomorrow. So uh, you can get your vaccinations. There are some other resources like uh, breast cancer awareness and COVID testing, some other resources. And uh, I believe the gift cards have been depleted. So there aren't any more gift cards to give away for first doses. They were on a limited basis. And this is in Spanish as well. I'm going to make sure I send these out today. So if you have anyone you'd like to share this to, you can get that out. And there are some more vaccination events next week in Burnham. And also there is one upcoming in Bridgeview. So if you go to our Cook County website calendar, you'll have you'll see all the upcoming events listed. If you or someone you know needs to get a vaccination or any other events that we have upcoming. And here's information on how to start a school clinic if you're interested, and information on best practices for this for the vaccination event, other educational resources and information on our My Shot campaign. So that is all the information that I wanted to update to you except for the Binex testing. And Jenna, you can put that in the chat. I am understanding that Binex supply is low right now. So we aren't accepting new Binex requests just yet. We will update you when we are able to replenish. Oh, she said we have some supply. So it changed from yesterday. So I just wanted to make sure. So disregard that. So please, if you have any um, requests for buy next, please send that to the website that is listed below. And and you know how to get in touch with Beth Heller at Shield if you like to start Shield for your school. So that is all that I have for updates. Again, there is no webinar next Friday, the night the fourteenth. We'll be back on the twenty first. Please send all of your questions and comments to the um, web addresses that we have. If we did not answer your question, you can send those questions to us and we'll try to get those together. And Lex will compile frequently asked questions from the chat and send it and I will make sure I send those out. We appreciate you guys hard work. I know it has been very stressful for everyone involved. We appreciate you, we appreciate all of your work. Thank you to Lex and to Michelle and to Dr. Joshi for taking the time out of his day to give us that information. I will make sure all of this is sent out to us. Thank you all and be well and stay warm. Happy Friday and happy new year. Mm -hmm.